Welcome to the Camp Owners Podcast, a space for camp owners to talk about the unique aspects of camp ownership and get inspired by each other. We're going to sit down with camp industry experts, leaders, and fellow camp owners to hear how the camp dream transpired for them, learn from each other, and discuss some of the biggest issues in the private camp industry. I'm Kelly Shuna. I'm the co-owner and director of Hidden Pines Ranch Day Camp in Stillwater, Minnesota. If you're looking on where to find and subscribe to the Camp Owners Podcast, you can either find us online at gocamppro.pro slash COP or by searching for us in your favorite podcast app. With us being a brand new podcast, we would be extremely grateful if you would rate, review, and subscribe to those apps. It will help us get the show out to other camp professionals and tell us a bit about why you love the show. Finally, if you're listening to this and think it would be useful for other camp owners or aspiring camp owners in your circle, please feel free to send them a note to listen. Today, as you might notice, I am flying solo without my co-pilot, Howie. Uh, he was not able to join us today, so I am going to trust our lovely producer, Matt, to assist me as needed. And I know our guest today um, is willing to take on that duty and uh, fly as my partner today. So our topic today is staff training and how and I thought it would be important to talk about staff training because as camp owners and directors, it is one of the most vital parts of our job. It sets the tone for the summer, the culture of our staff and drives the mission with our counselors. One of the opportunities and or challenges, depending on how you wanna look at it, is to come up with new and creative ideas for staff training that engage returning staff while ensuring the necessary skills and training that are present to keep our campers and staff safe. And especially if you've been doing your role for a really long time, it requires inspiration for each coming summer and to fuel that fire um, to make your staff training amazing and memorable. So we hope this discussion provides some new ideas and perspective that will get you excited and inspired for your upcoming staff training. So I would love to introduce our guest today. I had the chance to meet our guest for the first time at the ACA national meeting this year in lovely San Diego. And my first uh, introduction to our guest was when the amazing Ross Turner was receiving an award, a national award. And um, our guest serve at, served as the emotional interpreter um, for his friend. And I giggled and I laughed and I just, I still have a picture. I think I videoed it for some of my leadership team. Like, this guy is hilarious. And then I saw his name on one of the sessions about staff training. And I thought, oh, well, he was great as an emotional interpreter. So I think he'd be really great in his session. So I attended it. And after that, when Howie and I talked about this topic, he was the first person I reached out to because um, he did a really great job. So um, Paul, Kupferman is the director of Catalina Sea Camps and the summer operations director for Guided Discovery. So welcome, Paul. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, Kelly. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. So we always start, Howie and I, with having our guests kind of talk about that moment or time or it might be a couple of moments, but how you got into working in the camp industry and maybe when you thought like, okay, this is... Uh, this is my role in life. This is my passion and I'm going to follow it. Yeah. Um, I will, I will try to keep it short. I can <laughs> certainly be long winded. Um, I started going to camp, I think it's seven years old. Um, I attended uh, a handful of Jewish camps in Southern California and didn't love them. Um, it was not really my thing. I remember coming home and saying, wow, they pray a lot. And, and my parents said, but you, it's important that we attend Jewish camps. You're a Jewish person. And it just never clicked. And my older sister attended Catalina Sea Camp in 1983. I think that was year four and came home raving about Catalina Sea Camp. Um, I had to wait until I was 12. And in 1986, I attended Catalina Sea Camp and just fell in love with it. Um, it was um, everything that I could have ever wanted. It, it made me see that science was fun. It made me, uh, I, I was just around like-minded people. I was truly able to be myself there. Um, attended until I was 17 and couldn't come back and started working. Uh, worked all through college. And when college was over, like most counselors, we say goodbye. And left and worked in the children's television industry for, uh, for about three years. 
and was fascinated with the fact that I was making television for children. And the closest I ever got to a child was through a one-way mirror where I would watch them reacting to what we were doing. And I missed the interaction. I missed it a lot. And when an opportunity came up to get back into summer camps with uh, the programs that I'm, I'm now with, and that was, geez, that was about 21 years ago, uh, I jumped at it. Uh, thinking it was going to be a one or two year thing. And like I said, that was about 21 years ago. And uh, it, it is more than I could have ever imagined from working in an industry television where everyone's out to get everyone and people are, you know, is that person trying to steal my job? Is that person at that network trying to steal our ideas to working in camp where we just share? Um, I hug my competitors. Um, it, it is a world that I, I never want to leave. And having tasted the outside world, um, I know where I, I know where I am is right. I'm kind of picturing you as like a Mr. Rogers during that time of your life. I'm not sure if you were a cardigan, but that's what I pictured when you said that. Oh boy. Um, yeah. <laughs> I hope to, you know, when listening to you say that, obviously I was smiling, thinking about it, but um, whenever I hear people talk about it, I just, I wish that for everybody, right? Like I, I wish for them to have something that is so passion filled um, for their job because it never feels like a job. So I hope that um, everybody and our children and youth uh, get to have that same experience. Yes. So Paul, in speaking about staff training, again, the reason that I wanted you to be on is because obviously you've been in the camp industry a really long time and felt compel compelled to share resources at ACA about staff training. And I'm going to assume, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that staff training is important to you and that it is something you value and want to be able to provide resources for others in the camp industry and really do best practice. So I had as my first question on this topic is what are your top five, but you know, if you have a few less, we can do that too, but what are your top five must do's at your training or things that you think every camp director should consider for this summer? Uh, I think more important now than ever, is to get people in the summer frame of mind. And what is you know, each individual's summer camp frame of mind? Um, and so for example, uh, that first day at camp is for staff, just fun. And, and we keep the fun going for as long as we can, as long as I can stand from their first arrival at our program where there's cookies and costumes to take your staff pictures and uh, you just, in a way, making people feel as comfortable as possible. Uh, I go lots of sugar and great food. Um, we have fun tours, fun get to know you things planned. We have an amazing meal um, where we have just a giant taco bar with all sorts of different meats. Um, from there, it's just get to know you games. Um, I am really good at names as I think every camp director should be good with names. And I, at that point, I go around a room of a hundred people and I say everybody's name and I've been, it freaks me out every single time, but I just show them the importance of talking to people and not saying, Hey kid, or Hey you, but actually using their name and we play games. Um, we do the last two years, we've done big lip sync contests. And so before training week has started, I've gone around with all of our directors and I've had them lip sync to a very well-known song, you know, something by Journey or Bon Jovi or something like that. And we show that. And it's very funny to see, you know, the kitchen director and the maintenance director lip syncing and dancing and doing all sorts of stuff. And then we have them do it and we judge them and we just get into it. We get them. It's, you know, the training and the planning for camp and the educating is all going to happen tomorrow. But for now, I want them to feel comfortable, like they've made a right choice. And so truly, um, I think the summer frame of mind is my, my, top, uh, my top choice. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things that I thought of when you were talking was servant leadership, which one of the keynotes at ACA talked about. But the things that you're describing are all about that servant leadership and that top down and how you role model the lip syncing with your leadership team before you ask them to do it. So I love that. And yeah, comfort, sugar, feeling at home. 
always good thing. They love to eat, don't they? They need oh, yeah. food. Hey, yeah. who doesn't love free food? Yeah, and they don't want to get hangry. I get hangry. So if we can keep oh, them yeah. getting hangry, it's yes. all good. Do you have any don't do's? I know that when I was in your session, you had a couple of those. So any don't yeah. do's that you have? Um, geez. Um, boy, I, I will tell you, um, when I was a counselor, and you know, this is my, I walked uphill to school in the snow with no shoes <laughs> moment. Um, my trainer California? was- Yeah, well, yeah. Um, my trainer was in his 80s and was a football coach from New Jersey. And he was the only trainer that we had. And we did a lot of weird things that had nothing to do with the summer going off well. I remember spending hours picking up rocks on the soccer field. And I just, I, it, it didn't, you know, a, allow me to expand upon my abilities as a counselor later on. I could pick up rocks really well. Um, but it, 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 I just wanted to make sure, that, number one, that we had multiple trainers, multiple voices. Um, we need to not just have one trainer, but also hold our staff accountable. And I know I'm a doodler. I'm somebody who um, I, I'm already looking out the window and I'm not paying attention to you. And so I have to have ways to keep them involved. And so fun ways of taking notes, a la Michael Brandewine, um, and, and not just, so, so again, not um, hold them accountable. Don't just have one trainer. Don't use lecture as your main delivery tool. Getting out, doing games, debriefing those games. And, uh, and I, I'd say th those are my main don'ts. Mm -hmm. I had a couple things that I walked away from during your session was last year, I was so excited because I made a staff training, like a manual with those little claw binders. Sure. And I had put in there, you know, the schedule. So they knew what was happening and a place to take notes and words to the song. And it was great. I was so proud of it. And I think our staff really loved it. But during your session, it challenged me a little bit to think about that because you use a standard notebook. And I had asked you, okay, I use a binder. You have this notebook where each day you give them a sheet, not even each day, but more like each session. So you give them the piece of paper you would have put in that little binder and they have to glue it into their notebook and then they yes. fill things in on it. And so I, it, may, it challenged me to think a little differently. And you had said, well, you should say, I guess, why you do that versus the binder. Yeah, so we call that our interactive notebook, and that is 100% stolen uh, proudly from many teachers that have uh, graced our summer camps. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it is, they receive a notebook, like almost like a composition book, uh, day one, I'm sorry, day two, after they've had that fun day. The next day they, they're given, it has a note from me, a note from our leadership staff, you know, saying how important their job is and a schedule. People want to know what they're going to do. Um, right now, um, my kids need to know what their schedule is. When's breakfast going to be? When's lunch going to be? So they're not floating all over the place. So that's in those interactive notebooks. And before every meeting that we're going to have, before every, you know, we will have some lectures, they're going to receive sheets of paper like Michael Brandewine, um, kind of so they can follow along. There's certain places where they get to fill things in, but that interactive notebook is something that they can then use the entire time, uh, not just during training week, but while kids are there. Uh, we used to give legal pads. And when I found that when I turned a page on a legal pad, I never went back to it. And so having a notebook or having a composition book, I have found that our staff go back and say, hey, I was looking at something we done on day three and it really helped me out, you know, now seven weeks later. Mm -hmm. Well, and stolen, right? As a great leader, isn't that a leadership skill? Is I, I talk at staff training, I put a disclaimer up and I'm like, okay, listen, none of this is original Kelly Shuna. This is all from others. And I call it for them like my leadership shopping cart. So I hear Michael Brandwine at training like, oh, I'm gonna put that in my cart. And then hearing things from Paul about that. So it, they're all stolen, right? Like it's a sign of a good leader, I think, to have a little theft in your arsenal. But yeah. um, so I really, I took that away from your session, was challenged me to think about that a little differently about getting it more interactive for them. And I really like that a lot. Um, the other thing that I had seen when we talked about was, I'm going to skip to our third question, was incorporating technology because I think that's something, you know, it's that 
catch 22 a little bit about as most staff, most camps, excuse me, not all, um, don't have technology. And I know that on Catalina Sea Camp, you're on an island. Um, but how do you use technology prior um, or during um, camp for staff training? Um, so I'm still, again, learning all of this stuff. The gentleman who I presented with, Brian Straka, is Mr. Tech. Um, I would say the one thing that I've just started using this year uh, for communication is something called Slack. Right now, Slack is a great way to communicate with our staff, um, sharing documents, um, challenging them to do fun videos. Uh, Slack is a wonderful way to communicate with people. Um, I have a couple of other things in front of me. There's something called Flipgrid that is similar to Slack, but it's more video based. So you can, you know, uh, say, hey, share your favorite camp song. And then it, you can use Flipgrid. You just go to flipgrid.com. Um, you're able to use Google Forms to share documents, to take uh, quizzes uh, if you want them to do any sort of pre camp training. Um, there's other things there's you you can create fun quizzes on something called quizzes q u i z z i z um th there's just endless place there's endless websites to go to and find cool tech uh tech websites that are going to help during pre-training um like you mentioned we're on catalina and i love the fact that um we don't have cell service we have incredibly limited bandwidth in camp and so um other than really just using um, uh, you know, presentations, we don't use that much. Brian used something where you could put on screen, um, and I wanna make sure I have it right, something called pollev.com, where the beginning of a staff training session, you can have a question and you can say uh, one to three words about how you're feeling right now, and it'll create a word cloud, or it will create a pie chart or a bar chart pollev.com is something to keep them active before a training session. That's really cool to see and very interactive. Mm -hmm. I like that. Those were, that was one of the things that I wrote down from your pre presentation that you did. I had Pear Deck, also kind of a Google slide extension. We're using Slack for the first time with our 2020 staff. I learned about Slack through a GoCamp Pro masterclass on staff training. And I'm really excited about it. It's a really good platform because we're moving away from having a staff Facebook page because with our younger and younger staff, that's just not a platform that they tend to use. And so what I like about Slack is it replaces that as a communication tool, but it also allows for some really nice planning and having the channels for my middle school team or my sixth grade team. And then we're also using GroupMe um, as an app for quick messages. Like, you know, we're a day camp. So we have to sometimes remind them like, wear your camp t-shirt tomorrow, or it's going to be a hot one and bring water, whatever that is. But I really like Slack as well. And I'm really looking forward to having that platform and something different. And they all seem to be responding well to it. Um, so I think that's really nice. I liked also how you had for some of that pre-camp stuff, those Google forms to fill out to get their opinions. Um, as an easy tool that they're used to. I think um, when I was going to talk about technology, something that I think pushes us a little bit is different generations of staff. And so wanting to meet them where they're at and tools of communication and modes of communication that they're used to, have you had to adapt your staff training to kind of meet the needs of your staff and their generational norms or social or media habits? Yeah, um, two things that come to mind. Um, number one is listening, and number two is evaluations. Um, I have found that many of my 19 and 20 year old staff aren't great listeners uh, and aren't great at giving that uncomfortable eye contact that sometimes you need. And so uh, I did a lot of improv comedy and a lot of improv comedy is listening and not walking up, you know, to the stage and having, you know, a hundred ideas spit out at somebody, but um, to listen, to come there, almost empty your mind, say nothing and just listen. And so we have done something that I used to do in my improv class where um, we sit in front of each other. 
uh, one, it's a one-on-one -on -one partner and you sit with your, you know, crisscross applesauce and you look at them and one person has to speak uninterrupted for two minutes while another person just listens. They don't raise their eyebrows. They don't nod their face. They don't use their hands. They just sit and listen. And then you switch partners. From there, uh, there are a couple more exercises go in between, and then it ends with five minutes of just looking into somebody's eyes. And it is incredibly uncomfortable. There are some staff that, and you're gonna learn a lot about them in that moment, but that are not able to do that. Um, they just sit there and giggle and laugh. Um, that tells you a lot about somebody. Um, and so th that listening has really uh, helped our staff, you know, I, I'd heard, I think from Bob Ditter, you know, squat for a tot, lean for a teen. It just takes it that extra step. It's truly listening. And so we take that Bob Ditter and then we add in the improv training. So active listening, that's a presentation I've done before. Uh, and then with evaluations, um, we want our staff to know. We used to say, uh, it's important that you're always on time for activities. But now I have found that with this current generation, they need to know what that looks like. And so we have our 12 standards for what makes a good counselor. And we give them those 12 standards, break them up into groups, and they come up with examples of what those standards look like. Um, so I have an example in front of me. It says a counselor is always on time and prepared for activities. We ask our 19-year-olds, what does that look like? And they would come up with getting to meals and activities on time campers in appropriate attire for the activity that is scheduled, et cetera. And so they're truly um, defining what a good counselor is. I'm so glad you brought that up because that was one of the things that I had a note on for you to talk about. And that was a takeaway for me at your session. And I loved that because it's just on so many levels, it's so good. So I'm gonna incorporate that this summer of, yeah, what does that look like? And put them in small groups and then, sweet, my job is done in regards to evals for the summer. So I thought that that would be a really great tip for camp owners and directors or really anyone listening to this podcast that could take away and implement so easily this summer without any extra legwork on your part. So I thought that was so helpful. The other note that I had made when you were talking about Bob Dittner and active listening was the connect before you redirect. Hmm. And I like how you say that. We call it at our camp making deposit, which again, I've stolen. I think his name is David from Mountain Camps in California. I don't have his exact name, but he does a really great training session about making deposits in campers. And so that's what we tell our staff is that's Just like Dave, saying, Dave Brown. Thank you so Camp. much, Dave Brown in Mountain it's Camp. Wonderful. Am I getting that right? Dave Brown at Mountain Camp, and he is a, a hero of mine. Yeah. So, so fantastic. And that idea of, you know, not that maybe many staff go to a ATM anymore, but of my generation, that was something. But the idea of you can't withdraw money from your account or your Venmo. There, that's a hip reference. Um, you can't take money out of your Venmo account if you haven't put anything in. And so we need to make those deposits in camp in campers before we can make a withdrawal. So I liked your connect before we redirect. And what was it? Squat for a tot and lean for a teen? Yeah. I like it. See, I learned oh, something. Oh, yeah. I rhyming. Like so Let me tell you. <laughs> Rhy that's rhyming good. helps for coaching three-year-olds at T-ball or 19-year-olds at being yep. a summer camp counselor. Rhyme, rhyme, rhyme. Yep. So something that Howie and I talked about at the ACA conference was the idea of when do you bring staff in? Is it at the same time? Is it at different times? Like, do you bring new staff in? I know Howie does a new staff session prior to all of his other sessions to help those new staff get comfortable. I know some camps do a session, not a session necessarily, but bring in their returning staff early so we get those like, oh my God out of the way so that when new staff come, it is solely their mission to make them feel comfortable. So do you have any thoughts on that about methodology? And maybe on an island, we don't even talk about that because we all need to arrive via boat at the yeah. same time. But do you have any theories on that? Um, you, you hit the nail on the head. Being on an island and also being an outdoor education facility that goes all year round, I'm very limited. Um, and so... What I say, we have a life, we, we have two different staff at our program. We have instructors that all must be life lifeguard certified and first aid certified. And then we have our counselors. And we say that if there's an emergency, 
our instructors who are all 21 and over are going to hang with those people. And then our counselors are going to take the rest of the kids. And they're, yes, they're first aid trained, but they're not going to be attending to the emergency. They're going to be attending to everybody else. And so um, we have our lifeguard training that takes place beforehand, which is an amazing way for new staff to bond. Um, but unfortunately, um, I'm limited. Our Astro Camp facility, what we do there is we have our, first we have our internationals arrive to allow them to kind of decompress, kind of almost get on our time schedule. From there, uh, two days before staff training actually begins, the new staff arrive. And we want them to be comfortable. We want them to have a couple of people to look at and go, wow, this is weird, uh, or know where the bathrooms are. Um, I remember the first time I worked at our Astro Camp facility, I got up, it was dark, it was late, and the first thing I needed to do is use the restroom, and I couldn't find a restroom. And I, I realized how uncomfortable and how scary that feeling was. I didn't know where a restroom was. And so it's that the minute they get up there, we are giving them a tour, we're making them feel comfortable. So yes, if I had the ability to allow all of my first time staff come early, I would do so. It allows them to feel comfortable and get ready for those. Oh my God, do you remember last year when, <laughs> when Kelly was doing this? It was so funny. Um, because you, you can say, don't compare this summer or you know, to last year's summer, but it, it, it's just going to happen. And so if you have the ability to have new staff come a little early, do it. Mm -hmm. I thought about those new staff the other day when I listened to Brene Brown's new podcast, Unlocking Us. And if you, I don't know if you have a chance to listen to it, but the title of it was FFTs. And so for our adult audience, I'm not going to say it because you just never know if there's a future camp owner who's listening to this under the age of 18, but it's an expletive effing first time. And it talks about first times are terrible for everybody. They're vulnerable. It's scary. Like no one likes it. And maybe if you do, like, cheers to you. But first times are hard, even if you're an extremely extroverted person, like you might be, and I consider myself to be, they're still hard. And one thing she talked about was similar to, like, going to an AA meeting. She said the first time you come to something, you know, you're looking around like, oh, who are these people? Oh, I just, I do not fit into this at all. They are off the rails. And then, and you're thinking, I'm so much better than them. I'm so much smarter. And then day two, you're like, these people are kind of weird, but maybe they're not totally smarter than me. And then day three, you're like, these are my people. I found them. And that made me think about staff training and how that's probably exactly like they're feeling. And she has some suggestions about one, name it, like give it a name and talking to those, those first time staff that, yeah, this is uncomfortable and it's vulnerable and it's scary. So name it. She said, don't give it power by not naming it, because that's kind of a misnomer that people have. If I don't name it, it's not existing. She said, name it. And then the second one is, you know, give it a reality check, normalize it. And then the third one is give it perspective. And so I really like that. And I'm going to bring that up in my staff training this year right away of, hey, this is an FFT. And for kids, it's a terrible first time. So we can also, you know, make it kid friendly. But I love that. So I think like, yeah, this is uncomfortable. And you're probably looking around thinking, who are these people? Um, but as the days go on, and I'll continue to name them. I'm hoping that you're finding your people and we're not so crazy. Um, but I really liked that Brene Brown wisdom on that first time for staff. So I think that's, in, you know, in every camp has to do it different, right? And everything works based on your logistics and where you are and what you've tried. But I know for me, this being my fifth summer upcoming as owning camp, you know, I try each summer to do things differently, which I think each camp director listening to this, you try to have some same, some new, some different. But it also brings up the idea of using return staff. So I, you know, the first year of owning our camp, I just was like, let's just not burn this down and everybody survives. And I'm just going to try to copy the training that I think they did last year. And then year two, okay, like that worked, that didn't, I'm going to change it. Year three, four, you get better. And last year, I really tried to use returning staff 50% more than I did in the past. And they loved it. They were jazzed about training. The feedback from them was like, oh, best year ever. They, for all the reasons I'm sure you know, they loved it. But something that was brought up to me mid-summer was that they felt like maybe there was a divide between new and returning staff 
because those returning staff were seen as the experts and kind of really highlighted who was new and who was returning and maybe caused a little bit of a divide or a little made it a little bit harder to bridge that, you know, across the aisle partisan feeling of everybody's together. So I wanted to get your feedback on using returning staff as experts in your training. Um, and if you do that. Yeah, I'm actually in the midst of doing it right now. Um, we have something that we call our summer conference and it's smack in the middle of training week. Um, what I just did literally yesterday is I sent out an email to my staff and said, Hey, training week is coming up. Many of you are experts in whatever it is from, um, you know, to how to deal with bullies, to um, great icebreaker games or fun improv games. And so what I'd like you to do is give me a proposal, a three sentence proposal for uh, a 45 minute presentation that you would have the opportunity to do to staff. And with all of those ideas, and I've already received five different ones from these super motivated kids who have a lot of time on their hands, um, <laughs> great ideas for training week right now. And it takes up uh, a, a, a little chunk of your training week, but it, it empowers, um, it, it, it shows that, hey, you don't have to just go to the camp director or the head counselor or whoever it is, that that guy right there, he's really smart. And, and I know that I can ask him for help. Um, and so I just started doing this last year and it's a mini conference in the middle of camp and it has been wonderful. I've learned a lot. Um, and so you, you as a director have to take an active role in making sure that they send that presentation to you beforehand. So if there's any things that you need to correct, uh, for example, I had uh, one of my counselors say, well, when the, when the older kids are there, that's when you can play all the inappropriate music that you want. I had to say that's not okay. Um, but really, for the most part, it was a truly great experience. So uh, doing a mini conference in the middle of training week, rock and roll. I love, I love that idea. And I think you mentioned that in your session. And I would love to incorporate the summer. One of my favorite parts is the proposal. So it's really getting them ready to, if they ever become experts in any field, about what that takes to come up with a session and having that forethought about it. And, you know, I think what I had done the year before was make a Google Doc. And here's all the things that I would love to have presented and put your name by it. But your idea builds on that. And it's a little bit more intentional. And I think it makes the driver, the counselor of what are you the expert on? What do you want to present on? And maybe what am I missing that should be a part of training that I didn't already have scheduled? So I love that mini conference. How long do you allow for that? Uh, I give them 45 minutes. Okay. And, and so last year when we did it, I, I only had one, I had six different people send in proposals and I approved all of them. Um, I assume that I will have more this year. And so I will just have to adjust my training schedule. So is it one conference session and eat, every staff member has to pick which one to go to, or do you have yeah. three different yeah. so, blocks? Or? Um, there can be some that are mandatory for all new staff or mandatory for all people teaching sailing. But um, for the most part, it is all choose what you want to go to. If you're already really good at teaching icebreakers, then don't go to the icebreaker thing. If you really want to work on how to, you know, incorporate, you know, quiet kids into your group, then go to that one. Uh, just like us camp directors get to do at conferences. I love that. I think that's brilliant. So good. So good. But it really, it's, it's also giving your staff an opportunity to lead, to do things that some people fear the most, standing up in front of a group of people and presenting. And even though it's probably the best audience you're ever going to get, uh, it, is, it is a wonderful and empowering thing to give to our young people and to allow a 19 year old to speak in front of 25 people uh, that, and they've never done it before, before the kids get there is a really cool thing to give them. And something that I know 10 years down the line, someone's gonna say, hey, that moment that you gave us to present in front of uh, the staff is something that has stayed with me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm very excited to have that in our training week. Well, and maybe you could also incorporate those staff members that go to that session providing feedback. That was something that Beth Allison mentioned in that master class. You know, thinking about giving those new staff a role too, right? Because sometimes that hard is what role do they have? 
in many of those sessions. But one of her ideas was to give them like a feedback from like you'd receive at a conference and write down what that speaker presenter did well. And so maybe what things that they did well when they were teaching. Did they use good eye contact? Did they really captivate the audience? Some of those teaching skills that you want modeled and you want to see in your staff. Or, you know, how do they make you feel welcome, which maybe it's your values and your goals of what is one community. How do they make you feel welcome in that session? And then that new staff member could, if they felt comfortable, uh, maybe at the end when you debrief those, is they could stand up and share what some of those speakers did well. Because then I think it gives them a chance to stand up and speak in front of everybody and practice that. So I, maybe that would be a way to, to build on that mini conference is to add that feedback. I just love that idea of Beth's. I'm and taking that. Yeah. D there we go. I'm stealing from you right now. Oh, wow. Paul, you take it from Beth to me to you. I love it. Uh, the other thing that I thought about was the intentionality of mixing the new and returning staff after getting that feedback from one of my staff members was having core groups and training that they always maybe come back to where I've intentionally put a new staff member in there, a returning staff member or two that are in separate programs. So that made me think about some intentionality, intentionality about grouping. You know, I, I use Michael Brandwine stand up high five hands down when you have a partner i use a lot of those but it made me think about needing to be more intentional with how i group my counselors so. yeah for for training week i wouldn't say all the groups but most of the groups that are going to occur from skit groups to social media groups whatever it is i'm doing i'm making those groups mm -hmm. and i'm taking two sailors two divers two science two counselors and that's my group um, or I'm doing, you know, the, the thing that we do with kids and we say, all the ones are over here, twos are over here, one, two, one, two, whatever it is, um, I'm, I'm as intentional as possible, hoping that they then, you know, do the same thing when they have kids in camp. Model, 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 right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, fabulous. Any other things, Paul, that you were hoping to share today that I didn't bring up or popped into your head or any tidbits, tools, tricks of the trade that you feel like camp owners need to know during this podcast? Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I did have some notes. Um, one thing I learned, I, I may have mentioned this in my presentation, is that at camp we speak a language. And it is our own language, you know, at our camp, there's, hey, meet me in the LQ five minutes after lunch. To a new staff, they heard, how, how, how? And so you need to kind of break down the language that you have, maybe making a chart of camp slang or um, just reminding staff, hey, don't call the lower quad the LQ and don't say five minutes after lunch because that guy doesn't know what lunch is. Um, so that's really important is understanding that you have your own language at camp uh, and not uh, assuming that people know that. Um, that a great way uh, to get staff ready for your camp schedule is to have your training week mimic the camp schedule. So if breakfast is served at 7.30 every single day, by golly, serve breakfast at 7.30 every day. And if you give them 30 minutes after breakfast to go clean their dorms during training week, give them those 30 minutes. It's just acclimating them, um, getting them ready for camp. I have um, to add in at that moment because that was something that Jolly Corley brought up at a meeting for the Northland chapter here in Minnesota. And she had said that she kept getting feedback after every training of, I don't really know what a day looks like. Like, what does a daily schedule look like? And for years, they've been mimicking their schedule at training to a camp day, but they had never said it. And so she was talking to her leadership team and they were like, oh, we mimic it after a camp day. And she's like, oh my gosh. But sometimes we do things, but we don't say it and name it. So I think that that's important to then say, like, we are doing this just like a camp day. So they also can think the light bulb goes off if it didn't already. Yeah. Um, one thing that does not uh, affect our day camp friends, but we talked about intentional groupings. Um, when, when the staff get to camp, don't let them move into their cabins right away. Um, have them all live in one dorm. If you have a 12 person cabin, put 12 people in there. It's gonna be uncomfortable. They're gonna be living out of their bag for a couple of days, but put people who are not gonna to room together together. 
and make sure that there's returning staff, make sure there's new staff, make sure there's international staff, just mix it up like crazy. Um, that's an, again, another group that I create before staff get to camp. We fight tribalism, um, making <laughs> sure that, that they're meeting people that they might not meet, um, having intentional meals, that when they're going through the line to get their food, that everyone is given a number. And if you got number two, you're sitting at table number two and you're seated at a table with number twos, have a list of questions and they have to get to know people. Just, um, I feel that it's something that I did 20 years ago and I think it's just it's maybe even more important today. Fighting that tribalism, mixing up returners and new staff. Great. Oh, I love those, all those ideas, Paul. I, we could just talk forever. Oh, yeah. We a long-winded lady, too. So maybe it's a good thing we're not always co-captains because this would be two hours of podcasting. But could be. it was fabulous. Those were such great ideas. Before we move on to our inspirational moment, um, I want, just want to give out a shout-out to Howdy, Howie. We missed you. I can't wait to have you back. Paul, you did fabulous. But Howie, know that we're thinking about you. And then also... I would like to give a shout out to the Camp Code podcast um, for directors and owners to listen to that for some more staff training ideas and first class, first class counselors um, to listen to that one as, all, as well to get some skills and things that we maybe didn't cover. So the more the better in my book, the more skills, ideas, tools for staff training, the better we'll be as an entire industry. And for me, at least keep firing that, uh, fire up for staff training. So Paul, I don't know if you know this, but we always like to end our show uh, with something that's inspiring us right now. This can be a book, an article, a podcast, documentary, anything um, that is giving you some inspiration right now. So I will go first um, to model that for you. And what's inspiring for me is the new Unlocking Us podcast by Brene Brown. I thought her first episode especially is so applicable to camp and thinking about first times for our counselors and for our campers. So if you haven't checked it out yet, I think it will be inspiring to you. I loved it. Okay, All right, Paul, cool. what about you? Um, I'd have to say, if, if I had to say what's inspiring right now, uh, it comes mainly in the word of um, of gratitude and appreciation. And the person who has taught me most about that is, is my boss, the gentleman who started Guided Discoveries many, many years ago. And he is someone who has truly dedicated himself to making a difference in the lives of children. Uh, and at the same time, honoring and respecting his staff and other people's opinions. Um, right now in this time, there's lots of opinions that are flying around how camps are, are, are dealing with um, people complaining about decisions that are being made. Um, and and, and I, what's been wonderful is to see how Ross has been um, responding to these people complaining and appreciating the fact that they're taking the time to share their opinion, um, but then say, um, I, I appreciate that, here's our case. And it's just knowing that everyone is coming from their own place and right now more than ever, um, to understand where they're coming from is more important. Um, we're, you know, right now making sure that our company is strong and still has the ability to serve children, but at the same time, listening to parents who need a little bit of extra help, listening to teachers who need a little bit of extra help right now as well. So taking uh, other people's, um, their, their, their lives into account. Um, and showing them that appreciation, gratitude for being a part of our family and our community right now. Well, I think as a camp owner and director that that's inspiring to me to hear how, how you look up to him and how you see him react. You know, I was talking to my husband, Rowan's camp with me, and he had said, you know, owning business or being a director or being a leader, you know, in the good times, it's really great. And in the hard times, you have to make some of those really hard decisions and that's not always easy, but to hear that he's inspiring you with how he's doing that. If you had to label that, like what is it about what Ross is doing? Is it his tone? Is it leading with empathy? Is it uh, the extra time he takes to make a phone call versus send an email? Like if you had to describe and maybe model for us, uh, other camp owners director, what, is there something specific you think he's doing or that you can see or hear? Uh, it's showing appreciation to the people who have made us who we are, 
not just uh, our past staff, you know, he always uses the phrase, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, um, but he also understands that the, um, the families who have put an investment into us and into their children and coming to our camps to show them that same respect and appreciation. And, you know, even if it's an angry complaint, he still is saying, hey, thank you so much for being a part of our family and being a part of our community. Um, it's just that, that, that appreciation of um, that this is a really hard time and you have, again, uh, it, it really, for me, it's appreciation and taking the time to write a letter and not just a quick, sharp response. It's, it's, it's honoring them. I love that. I hope Ross has a chance to hear this. So as our exit to our show, I wanna make sure that Paul, people can get a hold of you um, if they'd like to. So can you tell us how people get a hold of you and find more, find out more about your program? Yeah, of course. Um, you can always, I, I think we have an amazing website. Uh, it is CatalinaCCamp.org. Um, we, geez, during the summer, we serve about a thousand kids. During the school year on Catalina, we serve 35,000 kids a year on Catalina. We have three sites. We are a, um, a hands-on marine science ocean adventure program on Catalina. Um, I like to say we have the most beautiful camp in the world. Um, I'm sure it's not true, but I like to say it. We have our own private beach and we try to get as many kids through there as possible um, to truly affect their lives. Um, again, that's at CatalinaSeaCamp.org. Our school year program is called CIMI. That's the Catalina Island Marine Institute. And the website is CME.org. And if you want to email me, sure, go ahead. Um, I'm at Paul at CatalinaSeaCamp.org. Man, I want to be a camper at Catalina Sea Camp. I wonder if I'm going to have to maybe put in my budget like a research and development trip to Catalina just to get some ideas. Come on out. Let's do I it. Like it. I like take, it. I'll take you snorkeling. You can pet some sharks. We'll have fun. Sold. Sold. All right. If you are looking to get a hold of me, you can reach me at Kelly with a Y at hiddenpinesranch.com. And our website is hiddenpinesranch.com. So thank you again for listening. If you would like to check out our show notes for resources and contact information, you can find that at gocamp.pro slash COP. You can find the resources that we put there and from all of our episodes, actually, from our very first one. We hope you enjoyed this and thank you again for listening, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.